Hi everyone, uh, my talk is titled RTFM, which as you will probably realize, uh, stands for Read the Effing Manual. Um, <laughs> it's an exploration into designing great instructions. Um, ooh. Go forward slides. Um, so uh, I'm a creative technologist and uh, during the day I run a library makerspace out at the University of Southern Queensland, which is based in Australia. So I've flown in for the conference and I am delighted to be here. Woohoo, yeah. G'day. <laughs> um, some of you may know me from some of my circuit board work online. So um, I make these beautiful circuit boards um, that are soldering kits and these are designed to get um, more people interested in electronics by making the boards, you know, a lot more um, like enameled pins than you would expect. Um, so these use a unique two-tone solder mask effect to achieve this kind of look. Um, I also, uh, a few years ago now, built this uh, two metre tall stainless steel art installation called the Party Button, um, which uh, you press the button and it plays one of 20 randomised party tracks and the characters at the top do a little dance. Um, so that's me too. But um, what I'm talking about today is my latest project, which are called Glow Stitch LEDs. Um, so these are made out of flexible circuit board material, and they're a super versatile way of adding lights to wearable technology and crafting projects. Um, so uh, you just stick them down with conductive fabric tape, and you can actually machine sew right through the tabs. And these were born out of a bit of a frustration with some of the current wearable technologies that were available. Um, so you, you've all seen Lilypad tech already, you know, up on the screen many times today. And if any of you have tried it out, you know how time consuming it can be to hand stitch with conductive thread, um, you know. And I've taught a whole range of different wearable technology workshops. And geez, not many people know how to hand sew anymore. <laughs> And even if you do, like it is still quite time consuming and labor intensive. And so um, these glow stitch LEDs um, can just be yeah, stuck down and machine sewn. And in this project example here, this is actually a rainbow fish pencil case. You can see me using the sewing machine to sew right through the tabs on those flexible circuit boards. And I've also got a 3D printed scale overlay that I put on top of this, which diffuses the light. And this is classic 3D printing on fabric technique. And uh, this build is actually inspired by the Rainbow Fish children's book, uh, which some of you may know. Um, it's about a little fishy. It's got little scales, and it gives the shiny scales to his friends. Oh, bless. Oh. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, you know, the other stuff you can obviously do with this is, you know, you can paint over the circuits, and you can add lights to artworks. You can do paper craft. You could do lots of kinds of crafts. You could do props and cosplay, like it's designed to be a one-stop shop to make it easy to put LEDs into crafting. And of course, they're open source. Um, Woohoo! <laughs> so um, they're OSHRA certified, and all of these um, panelized modules are up on my GitHub page. So if you are interested in making your own modules that you know include whatever functionality you wish, you are very welcome to just go in there and make your own. And I'd love to see you do it. Um, and this project is not quite available yet. Um, they're up on Crowd Supply. So this is my pre-launch page. I haven't launched the campaign yet, but if you are interested, I'd love for you to jump on this page and add your email address and sign up for updates. Um, but what this talk is about is my process in designing the instructions um, for these. And you've all probably come across a product that has bad instructions. So you've opened up something new and you're excited to learn it and you're like, wow, what's going on with these instructions? Uh, you might have been presented with no instructions or very little, a whole wall of text which you were not mentally ready to read in that particular moment, um, <laughs> or wrong or outdated material. Um, and of course, as you'll probably realize, if you have a product that no one knows how to use, your instructions are equally as important as having a good product because you can't use one without the other. And what bad instructions tend to do is really frustrate the customer. It, means it, uh, it leaves them feeling very overwhelmed and perpetuates this feeling that you're using your product is just too hard for them. And it also ends up making more work for you as well with customer support inquiries. Um, 
And bad instructions also often gatekeep and make it difficult for new users to use your product. Non-traditional users feel like they don't belong and they aren't welcome. And you're trying to learn, but will you ever get past this glass wall? And you may be asking, what is a glass wall? Uh, so some of you have probably heard of the term glass ceilings, where it is difficult to get into leadership positions. But glass walls refer to moving tangentially and moving between careers and interest groups. So as an example, it's generally used to describe gender segregated workforces where you have more men in trades, more women in nursing as a classic example. Uh, but I'm using it in this context to talk about some of our traditional interest groups or comfort zones. So obviously in the more feminine spaces, we have stuff like sewing and crafts and arty type suits. In the more masculine spaces, we have stuff like electronics and engineering and more practical type pursuits. And why I'm talking about this is because I still get so frustrated with how I personally run into my own glass walls all the time, and I see it so often in my workplace as well, um, people coming in and running up against their glass walls. And, you know, as an example, I teach, one of my favourite things to teach at work is a builder bot class where you get to come in over two days and you get to build your own robot creature from scratch. And it's inspired by the classic companion bot projects. And um, you get to use Arduino to make your little creature come to life with two motors and one LED light. And um, you get to do a bit of crafting as well. So you get to add a bit of character and life to it with some googly eyes or some faux fur or whatever it is. And um, often some of the more, you know, feminine types come along to the workshop and come to me early and say, Steph, I am stressing about this. Sweet Lord, electronics today for me? My God, please help me a lot right now. Workshop hasn't even started yet. <laughs> and, um, you know, some of the more masculine types arrive, have a great time, but don't end up doing any of the crafting aspects. You know, they sort of just leave with this naked robot. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, they feel like it's not for them, you know? And, um, you know, if you take anything away from this little, little talk that I've got, I'd like you to ask yourself if you have any of these walls in your own life or whether, you know, anyone else or, like, whether you could help remove these walls for other people. Um, yeah, and I think what's so, you know, exciting about like being at this conference anyway, is that there's so many fantastic wall breakers here. There's people who are pushing past those boundaries and getting into this exciting little space in the middle here, which I like to call the space between, which is a little bit less trodden. It's a little bit less explored. There's a lot more deep innovation to dig into there that not many people are getting into yet. And I think it is fantastically exciting to see what people are doing and making in that space. And yeah, wearable technology, of course, is one of those big spaces in that area. And uh, you don't really have, you know, that many people who have both textiles and electronic skills to combine in those spaces. And what this means for my product in particular is that I need to be radically inclusive um, because my wearable tech product is not something that, you know, it's something that is outside of many people's comfort zones. You know, it includes both, you know, electronics and also sewing and textiles, potentially. Um, so my instructions anyway, I've included both detailed, you know, electronics guidance plus, um, you know, a big page on sewing machine stuff, what size stitches to use and all that kind of stuff that you wouldn't potentially automatically think to know. And sort of getting onto my why here, um, why I end up doing these projects and getting into this kind of work is because learning technical things is often way too complex. Like, sweet Lord, we need to find a lot more ways to make learning more simpler, more fun, more beautiful, and more inspiring. And sometimes you feel like that little tiny guy there next to that massive set of stairs. You feel like you're too small and the first step is too big for you. You can't get over it. And learning something new takes us out of our comfort zone and is super time consuming as well. And the more that we can reduce that first step, the easier it will be to learn the more people we're going to have at these fantastic conferences. Um, so this is how my instructions began. Last year I mailed out about 30 sample packs to people around the world and it had just this one little page of instructions. And with all of the fantastic feedback that I got, 
I was able to go and improve it. And of course, I used an iterative design workflow. Um, so I sent it out and I got lots of feedback and I've been running this cycle um, quite a few times now to make sure that I can really improve the product and make sure it is the high quality standard that I'd like it to be. Um, and now the instructions with all of that feedback have blown out to 20 pages. Um, I've now got pages that include, you know, detailed electronics, tips on the tape, um, technical specs, troubleshooting, sewing, and a couple of project examples as well. Um, and the design principles that I've used to create these have been to um, have little chunks of bite-sized information that are always paired with some kind of a visual. Um, I'd also recommend to always include a troubleshooting page. Get those emails out of your inbox and let people figure it out themselves, please. Um, and you're always going to have to use some kind of jargon, and you can make that part of the learning experience by including some kind of a glossary page or making definitions. Um, some of the challenges that I've experienced with this so far is out of those 30 samples, only about six now are given feedback. Um, yeah, <laughs> wow, great. Um, so I've sent out a lot more since then, which is, yeah, fed back into it again. But, um, you know, out of those, four of my samples got lost in the mail. Another four people deleted their Twitter account, um, like, during the Elon Musk takeover. So I wasn't able to contact them again. And, yeah, I always need to consistently chase up testers for feedback. You also find that people um, misuse your product in new and creative ways that you never expected. Um, but, you know, that kind of stuff really gets you in the mindset of what they expected from the product and lets you feed back in other great, you know, concepts and ideas to make your product more versatile. Um, so my final sort of recommendations for, you know, if you are trying to make a product that is to a novice audience um, is to write a lot less. So turn your info into bite-sized, concise chunks. Always pair it with a visual of some kind. And you may look at those instructions that I just showed and thought, wow, that would have taken ages. Um, yeah, it did. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the process is time consuming, but um, it allows you to actually get right in the customer's headspace and think empathetically about you know, how they're using it and how you may anticipate problems before they even arise. Um, so yeah, it's a great thing to do. And obviously, don't underestimate the time as well for doing these iterative design cycles. Like, I expected to launch last year. That didn't happen. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm hoping to launch um, toward the later end of this year. Um, I would definitely recommend getting into some of the great tools we have available for creating those visual aspects of the instructions. Fritzing, obviously, is a massive one. Like, I can't count the number of times that I've opened up some kind of a kit and I've been presented with one of those black and white schematics. And I've gone, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, what is that? <laughs> um, you know, especially when you're starting out, like that kind of thing, like doesn't quite communicate as much information as you would wish. Like it's great for advanced, um, you know, audiences who get a lot of information from those, but definitely recommend fritzing um, because it communicates a lot of info, obviously, you know, with the full color and you know, someone starting out may not realize what a breadboard is or that they actually need to use it. And by looking at that, they can start to unpack that information and really figure out visually how things are actually meant to come together. Um, also definitely recommend Canva as well. Super easy drag and drop interface to just pop in those visuals without you even needing to make them. So make it super easy and speedy for yourself, beautiful templates available. Um, but if you do want to make your own images, definitely recommend diving into some proper vector software. So I personally use Adobe Illustrator, um, but there's also obviously Inkscape and Affinity, um, so you can actually start getting in there and making some really high quality polished visuals to match your instructions. Um, another one of my little secrets is I uh, have a subscription to Icons 8. Um, you know, there's lots of those out there, but it allows you to just download a whole bunch of, you know, licensed, images and vectors that just make it a real speed run to muck around and make those instructions without fiddling around and making a big image of a sewing machine or something, you know? Um, and so I suppose my final recommendation is to, you know, not just RTFM, but to 
WTFM, which is write the effing manual as well. <laughs> so the smaller that we can make those first steps for someone to get into electronics, the easier they're going to climb up that set of stairs and get into the more complex um, projects. Um, and the more people are going to have it, great spaces like this, and the more people are going to have, you know, actually solving some of the most challenging and rewarding problems that we currently face. Um, in future, what these instructions will have as a polishing step is to include QR code links to videos showing real details and, you know, like, yeah, proper visuals on how to put things together. Um, I'm also looking at doing one final round of samples before production. So I want to make sure that I send out a, you know, a final, like, copy of what I expect the packaging is look going to look like, what the instructions are going to look like, and what the hardware is going to look like. Uh, before I press go on the big production run to make sure it is as polished as I can make it. And yeah, crowdfunding later on this year. Um, so if you like the look of that, um, you're very welcome to jump on my website and check out some of those instructions that I've made, the printable project sheets, and some of my teacher resources as well that I've made. I also have with me that rainbow fish pencil case and a whole bunch of physical samples that you can, you can come say hi and check them out. Um, yeah, thanks so much.